uh, I want to thank you first, though, for the invitation to be here. Um, I feel a, a very, very deep connection to uh, your country and uh, am very, very interested in what's been going on, uh, especially lately over there with regard to this issue. Um, uh, my name is Doug Haldeman. I am a, uh, sorry, did I, no. Uh, my name is Doug Haldeman. I'm a professor uh, and director of a doctoral program in clinical psychology here in the San Francisco Bay Area at John F. Kennedy University. I've been doing uh, work in the area of conversion therapy, uh, I suppose now for almost 40 years. Uh, for many years, for 30 years, I was uh, in private practice uh, in Seattle. And during that time, uh, I saw many, many patients who had uh, survived conversion therapy and were seeking to uh, resolve the negative effects of it. I actually came to it rather by accident because one of my very first patients in 1982 was a young man who had been through uh, electric shock therapy uh, sponsored by uh, his religious institution, Brigham Young University, which is run by the Mormon Church, when he disclosed to his uh, school, the, the counselor at the University Counseling Center, that he was gay, he was sent to uh, 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 aversion uh, treatment uh, along with the um, electric uh, uh, ECT emulators hooked up to his hands and his genitals. Wow. I am graphic in that description because it absolutely shocked and stunned me that this sort of thing was going on. And I immediately got in touch with my professional organization here in the US, the American Psychological Association to say, what's our policy on these kind of practices? Surely this is, this, this is tantamount to, to torture. Uh, uh, you know, what, what kind of, what does this say about our adherence to the Hippocratic oath of not doing harm? And the response I got back was, we don't have any policy on this, which sent me then into um, a very, very deep review of the literature, as well as starting to do my own clinical research on the issue, which was much more of a qualitative nature. Through the years, and I'm going to do the Cliff Notes version of this, we at APA developed a, a successive series of, of three different policies on conversion therapy. The first having appeared in 1997, questioning simply the ethics uh, of conversion therapy and reminding practitioners that they had no right to engage in uh, treatments that might be harmful to people or that disseminate inaccurate information about sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. Gender identity at the time was not even mm -hmm. on the screen, I am sorry sure. to say. Sure. In 2009, we convened a task force to do a very, very deep dive into almost 100 years of literature on conversion therapy of all sorts of techniques that were intended to, to change uh, 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 same-sex attraction and behavior to heterosexual orientation. Uh, you know, you, the, the usual aversive methods, but also masturbatory reconditioning, uh, uh, asking women out on dates because mostly the target focus here was, was gay men. And then, they found uh, a content naive methodologist found absolutely no basis for claiming that conversion therapy works mm -hmm. uh, or is successful, but stopped short of saying it's harmful because at the time there was not empirical research. And there were several of us thinking, how on earth would you ever get empirical research? And it wasn't until a couple of years ago that such research, because of population-based studies, was able to demonstrate the potential harm uh, in a number of ways of sexual orientation conversion therapy, as well as gender identity conversion therapy. And so it was only last year that APA adopted its current stance um, prohibiting conversion therapy. 
by, by psychologists. And uh, hopefully this will help other jurisdictions develop laws such as you're struggling with right now in the UK. Mm, mm, thank you. When um, we've been, the Pink Therapy, we've been working with this matter and the Coalition Against um, Conversion Therapy for, for many, many years and have produced the Memorandum of Understanding Against Conversion Therapy. And we've got several people in the meeting today who have also been involved with that and represent organizations that have signed up to that. When the government, and we thought that, well, certainly I, my, my impression was that um, when the government produced their, their plans for legislative change last December, that uh, it would include a religious ban on, on this matter. Um, not, um, not just in the context of therapists, because we knew therapists were inadvertently committing, often inadvertently committing conversion therapy, but it was clear that the it, um, pastors and, and the churches and ministers were, were doing most of this. Um, yes. And I think um, Adam Jowett was commissioned, commissioned by, by the government to do a quick study on this for from Coventry University and he found that that was the case too I mean, Adam's also here I, I think but but I'm wondering what your thoughts are about our government trying to trying to uh, give a religious exemption to this matter and whether that whether that's going to be an effective law or not well uh, I, I first of all I would have to say good luck with trying to get uh, uh, religious practitioners included in a law such as this, it's it's not even a question here in our country that is okay. still driven by uh, puritanical interests and mm -hmm. uh, uh, Christian-based values. However, uh, and in in Adam's report, which by the way is absolutely an excellent, excellent resource. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in the report from Adam and his colleagues at, at, at Coventry, it suggests that up to 80% of their uh, study participants were um, treated uh, in the UK by religious practitioners, uh, which means that it's, it's, it's so important uh, to at least address that issue. But to colleagues here in the U.S. who have said to me, uh, you know, what's the point of these bans, uh, really, if they don't touch most of the conversion therapy that's happening? My response is, we have to consider that the bans themselves function as a public health advisory. Right. Because after all, the data on which we are basing these will suggest that this is a public health hazard given the uh, 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 overwhelming evidence of the potential harms and dangers of these practices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it, it does send out a very clear message to the rest of society. And we're not a very religiously influenced culture here, in, uh, uh, unlike you have in the States. So whilst it's 80%, it's a fringe, it's a fringe part of of where it's happening. It's important that I think it gets addressed, but I think it's also important that therapists in general understand that they, that they, they can't engage in the, this um, trying to help people uh, become straight. Uh, and certainly Mike King did some research a number of years ago about this, um, where ordinary therapists from the various professional bodies were in, in a randomized controlled trial uh, sample and 17% um, of therapists have agreed to, had agreed to enter uh, contracts to reduce same-sex attraction and 4% had worked on a uh, cure with clients. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that was pretty uh, shocking when, when that came through um, and certainly fueled my participation in, in working with the coalition. Um, what are you could what could you say to us about the evidence of harms on gender identity change efforts from your work with editing the book? Um, because this is what the, the the government here seemed to want to drop gender identity, 
um, uh -huh. and just focus on se sexual orientation, which I think is incredibly dangerous. Um, what are your thoughts about, about splitting that off? It um let me tell you, I think that is an absolutely terrible idea. I wouldn't support it at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I can understand the outrage that seems to have been, I mean, I have to, I, first I have to ask sort of like, what's going on over there? I mean, really, I mean, I feel almost like there's this, it's like the weather in London, you know, it can change at any minute mm -hmm. that, that there have been these, first this proposal uh, and then it was withdrawn by your prime minister. Mm -hmm. And then now it's been put back, but mm -hmm. absent the, uh, uh, the, the inclusion of gender identity. Is that, is my That's right. the story? That's right. Yes. Well, as I under, I mean, I read a little bit about this, I think in the, in the, um, in the independent or one of the UK newspapers online saying that the, the uh, ostensibly the rationale for doing this was that uh it was felt that it was too uh i don't know what provocative or too complex to speak with controversial mm -hmm. about their gender identity which mm -hmm. frankly i don't buy that at all i think this is likely politically motivated and that when the first statement came out there was a lot of outcry i'm I mean, this is just my fantasy. I don't know sure. that much about sure. British politics. You know, we've got an, enough of mess of our own going on over here. But you have this this uh, uh, political faction that is really opposed to uh, doing anything about this subject, and certainly opposed to any kind of legislation. Which is mm -hmm. why we in the U.S. have only twenty jurisdictions so far, instead of all fifty. But regardless. Um, I, I do not think that uh, the winds of, of political, uh, you know, movements or whatever are a good basis for making public health decisions. And this definitely is that. Now, to answer your question, what we have found uh, here in the States is that, uh, in fact, there's a researcher here in San Francisco, Caitlin Ryan, whose work you probably are familiar with, with the Family Acceptance Project at uh, at san francisco state and she has found that gender identity uh, uh conversion therapy can uh be two to three times as likely to cause actual suicidal behavior among uh, uh youth and among young people uh, and i think that the reason that it is uh, so so critical for the religious aspect of this to be addressed in some way is that religion carries with it this extra, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, power to induce guilt in people because you've got guilt to begin with about your sexual orientation or your gender identity, and then you've got guilt for not being able to change it. And in my clinical experience, working with folks who had been through both sexual orientation and gender identity, uh, conversion therapy, especially in their youth, the damage goes way into adulthood. Sure, sure. Uh, 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 her statistics show, you know, 67% more likely to engage in a serious suicide attempt requiring uh, medical attention and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think it is a terrible mistake to uh, exclude uh, trans people from this legislation, and I hope there will be some way by which it can be uh, reinstated. Otherwise, how can you support mm. uh, a ban that only is good to protect some of us in our community and not all of us? For sure. I think it's absolutely crucial that we, we stand together with our trans siblings on this. I was, I was looking at um, the, your, your book and Judith's chapter at the beginning of the book, and she was quoting Green and collaborators in 2020. And I think maybe it's useful. I'll just give some of the reader a small bit of this for, for the people at home. So Green and collaborators in 2020 assessed the impact of sexual orientation change efforts in a large study, that's 34,000 people, of the experience of sexual minority youth and suicidal ideation and attempts. Um, and they found uh, that those who reported undergoing sexual orientation and or gender identity change efforts, because they're often very, confl they're conflated 
a lot of the time, were yeah. more than twice as likely to report having attempted suicide and having multiple suicide attempts. Those who reported exposure to SOCE had almost two times greater odds of serious considering, seriously considering suicide, and more than two times greater odds of having attempted it, and two and a half times greater odds of multiple suicide attempts in the previous year. I mean, it's, it's very worrying when our, our young people are killing themselves or wishing themselves dead. And it's completely understandable as to why they might be feeling that way, given the way that the press has been hounding uh, trans kids, certainly here in the UK. I, I have no idea how it's been there, but we've been having we've had some absolutely appalling stories in the in the newspapers and mass media. Um, and I think that's created a, a real climate of, of fear for people who are um, who are trans or gender non-conforming or exploring their gender and wanting to talk about it um, and, and frightening clinicians in in being able to talk about that with them because they don't know they don't know enough they don't know enough how to work with it in an affirmative manner in an exploratory right. manner yeah um, I, and you may have heard uh, recently uh, here in the U.S. in the state of Florida, the governor signed uh, uh, into a, into law a bill that is actually called "Don't Say Gay," mm -hmm. uh, and it also covers "Don't Say Trans," in mm -hmm. which uh, there are prohibitions on uh, free speech around the discussion of these issues, the very discussion of these issues. I mean, what kind of message does that send? Sure. Uh, uh, you know, and here again, we see the the really pernicious aspect of politics getting involved in a public health matter mm -hmm. in which, yeah, you know, uh, there are some conservatives who believe in free speech as long as they endorse it. And that's not free speech. Yeah, that's not free speech. No. Hypocrisy. No. Um, the, the, in the UK, our coalition of against conversion therapy has, has had asexuals alongside gender as, as two protected groups. And all of the major therapy organizations and other bodies that have signed up to that document have um, signed up to, to protect asexuals, particularly from sex therapists who might be trying to treat them for hypoactive sexual desire disorder or inhibited mm -hmm. sexual desire or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I, I don't know, and, and asexuality is, is now being seen as a sexual orientation, but what we don't have in the UK is protected characteristics for, for asexuals. Um, and I, I, I haven't seen elsewhere in my reading of uh, people producing these bans internationally and certainly in the states whether asexuals are enjoying protections and are being included in the lgbt or where, or not and i don't know what your what your knowledge is about that and so i thought maybe it's useful to to, to, to find out what you know and also just to raise it for everybody else who's watching that we mustn't neglect asexuals um, in in this fight for human rights and for yeah, uh, absolutely. And I guess what I would say in response, Dominic, is you are uh, you in the UK are really on the cutting edge of this issue. OK, it was not anything I have heard even discussed, really, uh, in in my uh, uh, circles, professional circles here in the US, let alone researched. However, it puts me in mind of thinking about the, the wide variety of sexual orientations that we now mm -hmm. uh, uh, include uh, in terms of, of uh, gosh, demisexuality, sapiosexuality, all the kinds of sexualities that, mm -hmm. frankly, I must confess, I hadn't even heard of until all those, you know, those flags all came out. And I congratulate you on this. And I I feel like I have something to, you know, take back with me now to our groups here in the U.S. and say we need to follow their lead. Mm. We need to be yeah. respectful of everybody that we say we include. Then, if we say we that you're included, then 
you also are protected and you're protected by our advocacy until we get actual laws and until we get a better public understanding uh, I mean, when I think about the difficulties that the American public has had even understanding sexual orientation and how it is distinct from gender identity, I mean, we are really just still at a very, very basic level mm -hmm. of being able to not just formulate legislation, but educate the public as well and educate, as you point out, Dominic, the therapeutic community. Sure. which is to say, how do we reach those practitioners who are well-intended, but very, very naive? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you know? yeah. Yes, I mean, you've, you've got, it, within the APA, there was talk about uh, the LGBT concerns. I remember that when the guidelines came out, it was <clears throat> guidelines to protect people, uh, the LGB people, and, and we didn't have the A, except the A is added to LGBTIQQA blah, 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 everywhere else, and yet nothing seems to be said about protecting the A's and um, supporting the A's. So uh, I'm glad to hear that we're pioneering on that. Yes, um, you are. We'll carry on, and I'll talk to some of my friends and colleagues at ASECT in the States about maybe trying to get asexuality on the agenda for, for them in terms of policy too. Yeah. Great. Yeah, keep me in the loop on that because I'm very interested to follow up on that. Let's see. Let's see what what the questions are, maybe in the chat. And um, have we had any comments or questions, LJ, that you can? Um, yep, we have a question about. Um, it would be really interesting to hear something about the impact and prevalence of other kinds of sexuality conversion around. For example, ACE that we've talked about, but also kink and bi and non-monogamy. And can you tell us anything about that, Doug? Well, um, again, uh, our, our, our study of, uh, let's say, kink uh, sexual practices is very, very limited by the government's restriction of funding. Uh, and so far, there is not really a lot of research on kink, I recently um, was the chair of a student who did a doctoral dissertation on BDSM activities among Asian American populations. And we found it extremely difficult. All of the literature that we were able to discover had been published abroad, uh, uh, some in uh, Scandinavia in particular. And, and so in terms of uh, uh, um, educating the profession, I think the, the focus right now, as I understand it, the current president of our LGBTQ division at APA is a uh, kink identified therapist here in the Bay Area, Richard Sprott. And uh, he is spearheading really an effort more on kink awareness uh, because there's a lot of anti-kink sentiment even within our own communities. Uh, mm -hmm. Lack of understanding of what is involved, a suspicion, a, uh, you know, just, just lack of information that needs to get uh, disseminated uh, uh, as well as to the public itself, I think, before we are able to, you know, formulate guidelines for, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, best practices working with kink individuals. Uh, yeah. yeah, they've got some good, some good new clinical guidelines on kink that came out in December mm -hmm. that uh, um, have been very helpful, and we've been using them in our teaching module on on BDSM and kink. Yeah, and I think it's also important to try and depathologize the notion of kink mm -hmm. from the standpoint of this is someone uh, the uh, you know kink. Uh, uh, oriented individuals really are uh, harboring an undetected or, you know, subliminal mental illness, uh, whereas this, there is absolutely no evidence. Sure, it was taken that. out of the DSM some, some years ago, and, yeah. um, and, and now we're just looking at normative sexual variation, unless somebody is just deeply distressed about it. Um, what's, let's, let's, can we, I see a question mm -hmm. around from Chris. Can we not challenge the term therapy within conversion therapy description? Clearly oh, it isn't my. therapy and it's more coercion and abuse. 
Well, uh, let me just say from my perspective, um, the uh, uh, scholarly community, uh, as I've been involved with it here for the last several years, has not used the term conversion therapy. Mm -hmm. In fact, 10 years ago, when we successfully got the first ban in the US on conversion therapy among mental health professionals here in California, it was based on our argument that this is what it's commonly known as, but it isn't therapy. Right. And so don't worry about the fact that you're legislating a kind of therapy because you're really just giving a public health advisory against a type of charlatanism. However, um, when, uh, when I was getting ready to submit the book to APA, it was supposed to be called Sexual Orientation Change Efforts, mm -hmm. colon, Evidence, Ethics, and um, I can't remember all what it was called, but the editors came back and said, we all sat around the table and nobody knows what you're talking about. And we want to actually call it the case against conversion therapy. Mm. Because if we don't know what you're talking about, right. how do we yeah. expect you know anyone else to know? And so I wrote back and I said, okay, provided that you put the term therapy in quotation marks. Sure. That's the only way I can lay it. out. Whenever I write it, I, I tend to put scare quotes around it too, um, because it's not it's not therapeutic, and there's been no evidence of it being therapeutic and there's now many lots of evidence that it is harmful um, yeah. and that that later study that you talked about from uh 2009 onwards to 220 has right. been able to pick up on the harms and there is there significant harms um and right. so it's really important i think that we we call it uh we we we, we treat that word therapy with a lot of suspicion. And, but I can understand it if we say sexual orientation change efforts or SOCE and GICE as, as you do in the book, it's, it's hard to know. How do you say that? Do you, do you say all the letters? Is it so C GICE? It's like, it's hard to figure, isn't it? So we used to call it SOCE. SOCE. So it sounds sort of Italian, but um, <laughs> you know, that's exotic. Okay. Um, okay. But, uh, you know, this, this, this conversation um, about how to name things, it really, really is a very, very tricky one if what we want to do is, is, is educate the public. You know, I don't know if you've found this to be as, as true in the UK as here in the US, but we still, I think, on a daily basis are trying to explain what this actually means, turning queer people straight or cisgender mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes um, so we have a question about what is the impact of the government decision in excluding trans people and what might that mean for therapist groups who are in favor of conversion therapy well we can't know the impact of, of what's mm. going to happen because we can't predict that but I think it's going to leave, give a lot of um, uh, encouragement to those groups that are aligned on trying to uh, eradicate what they, they might be calling rapid onset gender dysphoria and, and, and um, trans kids. I think, it's, I, I think it's going to leave those young people feeling much more vulnerable mm -hmm. um, and those groups that are trying to do that much strengthened. And this is why I think it's absolutely crucial that we stand together and we make sure that the, the government don't flip flop on this. And I think given the groundswell that's just been happening in this last, just these last few days, when on Thursday night they announced that they're going to drop all, the whole plan together. And then by Friday morning or Friday lunchtime, they're saying, oh no, it's, we're just going to drop the, the gender. Well, now since then, Stonewall coming out, the, cons the LGBT consortium coming out, and everybody else saying, "Well, we're not playing ball with your silly conference idea about safe to safe to be in the UK." That we're withdrawing all of our support from your your so-called world-class conference. Then I think maybe 
we can put pressure on the government. And I think it's really important that people watching this do take an active role at, at talking to their MPs about it. The reason we are sharing all these resources in the chat with you and the reason we're putting this event on is that we want you to be able to share the recording with your MP, to be talking to them about all of this so that they're informed and on board and, and leaning on Boris uh, to make, you know, to change his mind again. Do you think that, that these groups that are anti will have more legitimacy insight with around things like the MOU? Are we? My, uh, I would say yes, I would, I'm afraid so. And I, I'd be interesting to hear what some of my colleagues on the MOU who are here uh, might say about that and whether any of them want to, to come and talk. Jeremy, I just put a question in. Um, and Jeremy is Jeremy Clark is chair, deputy chair of the MOU. He says the reparative therapy movement, as far as I can understand it, originated within American psychoanalysis when the American psychiatry decided to declassify homosexuality as a mental illness but some in the psychoanalytic community didn't agree. Is this still the case? Are there still psychoanalytic practitioners who believe that it's possible, and in some cases ethical, to work towards sexual orientation or gender identity change? Or is this position no longer accepted in the USA? Well, I was, I was in touch with Jack Drescher over this the other day because yeah. I saw some articles in the British Journal of Psychoanalysis that were um, still talking about cures and change. And I was horrified to see that and wrote to him and said, I thought you guys had got your house in order. And he said, oh, well, here's my response to, to, uh, to some of that. Um, um, and we had a bit of an exchange over that. I was horrified. I mean, I don't know, are you connected to the psychoanalytic movement in, in the States, Doug? Uh, really only through Jack. I mean, right. most okay. of what I know about uh, what's happening. But I also, well, I wouldn't say only through Jack. I would also say through APA, mm -hmm. uh, my colleagues there who are psychoanalysts uh, and psychoanalytically oriented, uh, of course, are not part of this uh, 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 conversion therapy <laughs> group. But uh, I do believe uh, 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 that, that the comment was very, very well taken that in the early 90s in particular, and with the work of Joseph Nicolosi and the, the NARTH organization, there was a tremendous uh, backlash on the part of the psychoanalytic community to retain their hold, if you will, on conversion therapy. It was really based on their uh, uh, un, untested and unproven right. theories about the development of sexual orientation don't need to go into all that however mm -hmm. when it became clear that mainstream psychology psychiatry and psychoanalysis mm -hmm. at that time the and, and of course the affiliated mental health professions the social workers and the counselors were all moving toward a negative position on conversion therapy they tended to more go underground Right. And so you don't really hear much about them these days, but I do believe that they they still exist, but not in a very, very public way at all, and certainly not in the organized mental health groups. Well, this was in the British, I think the British Journal of Psychoanalysis. Um, mm -hmm. Marcus Evans, I think, was writing. Um, and Jack came over in last November to, at the invitation of the psychoanalysts, to give a lecture. And they they had been leading up to an apology. Um, and instead they backtracked on making a full apology and, and just issued a statement of regret about the way that psychoanalysis had treated uh, LGB people and didn't uh, apologize or make a statement of regret about their treatment of trans people at all. Um, and, and Marcus Evans is one of these um, anti-queer anti analysts. Um, oh, and Jack and he had had a had had a commentary or head to head in in the journal. But I was really shocked that the journal felt uh, it was OK to be publishing this kind of stuff because and giving legitimacy to it. So it was it was quite. Yeah, it was a shock. Mm. 
LJ, have we got anything else in the chat? Anybody else? Um, there are, is commentary about Scotland and Wales changing the laws under the devolved powers and will that make a difference? Um, and Joe uh, points out Scotland has power for this, Wales is taking legal advice. That would be good. That would be another way of putting incredible pressure um, on it, uh, on the government. I think if there becomes a split over the Wales and Scotland um, taking a very different stance on this. Interesting. Hmm. You know, I also thought I'd make a comment about, I was just having a, a conversation with Elon Meyer, uh, who mm -hmm. is the uh, author of the Minority Stress Model. Uh, and he and a colleague of his at the University of Southern California, John Blosnich, uh, published a couple years ago a population-based study, uh, I think following the Green article that you cited that mm -hmm. uh, indicates clearly uh, that there is harm, increased suicidality after conversion therapy attempts. Mm -hmm. Now, right. these data, it is, it is very, very easy for some of these uh, groups. There is, uh, for example, a, an anti-gay religious institution in Arizona called the Ruth Institute, whose leader uh, recently published in a pay-for-publish journal right. uh, an article uh, totally corrupting and misrepresenting the Blasnich data to suggest there's no difference. There's no difference. If you look at these data with people who have been through conversion therapy and those who have not, who identify as same-sex oriented in terms of suicidality. Mm -hmm. But the corruption of the data uh, uh, was the result of having looked simply at people after one episode of conversion therapy. And uh, I'm currently writing an article, which actually might be the basis for a book, we'll see, don't hold me to it, about clinical experiences working with individuals who uh, I, I can, of, of the hundreds of people who had been through conversion therapy that, with whom I have worked, very few had only gone once. The vast majority had multiple exposures sure. to conversion therapy. Why? Because the first time wasn't successful, but, you know, the guilt and the mm. sense of uh, threat of loss of family, community, church, whatever, the unknown about the, the queer community, all of that mm -hmm. uh, causes people to go back sometimes many times sure. before finally giving it up and coming to someone who can try and help them heal from the damage that was done. And so I think it's important for us to stay vigilant about what's out there in the, um, how shall I say, less than reputable literature. And I'll put that in air quotes too, because uh, at least in our country, when you pay to get stuff, I mean, you can get pretty much anything published and put a journal name on right. it and make it sound like it's respectable research. And yeah. then the media pick it up and we're off. That's to a good system. point. That's a very good point. Yeah. Or you can just announce your re so-called research to the New York Times, like J. Michael Bailey does, and they pick it up and it gives it legitimacy when he said bisexuality didn't exist in men, um, which is just complete spurious nonsense. Um, yeah, I, I think the harms are really significant, actually, about the why do people go back for treatment? Because that transferential relationship that the therapist establishes in that first meeting, which is, I can, you know, I can do this with you, and they instill great hope in the process of being able to cure, you know, we will do it together, God will help us, your parents will help us. Let us pray. Let's build everything. You can do this if you're really motivated. I believe in you. That sets up um, for when it fails, because it's going to inevitably fail from all the data we've seen. Um, tremendous disappointment and suicidality and self-blame and low self-esteem. And I think those kinds of torture techniques, those kind of psychological torture techniques are really insidious and make it very hard for therapists um, like ourselves afterwards to try to follow up and, and restore a, a therapeutic relationship which, um, which has hope that they can reconcile 
where they're at rather than change where they're at. Right. Um, and I'm really glad that you're going to help. We're, we're putting together a, a training module for survivors of conversion therapy who oh, have been yes. through this. And, and you've offered to be part of our working group with Joe Russell and me and a couple of other therapists here on that, because I think it would be really to try to look at those techniques. Did I just lose my microphone? Uh, you lost something. Um, I think my microphone. Just, oh no, I think you're back now. Don't yeah, worry. I think my microphone just cut off. So I, yeah. I mean, I don't know at what point it cut off there, but I'm I'm glad that we're working on trying to um, sort that out really and try to to develop a training program to help therapists work with <laughs> survivors of conversion therapy. Because it's a tricky field, I think, to be. Oh, it's very, very tough because of the layer upon layer upon layer of guilt and self-deprecation around that. I think in the literature that we have focused lately a lot on suicidality and suicide attempts, because that's uh, an easier thing to quantify mm -hmm. than uh, chronic depression. Mm -hmm. and low self-esteem. Uh, mm -hmm. The other thing I noticed and was working with constantly was sexual dysfunction mm -hmm. because of yes. the conversion. The shame and guilt. Yeah, yeah would, would very often leave people, you know, not straight, but mm -hmm. not able to, to express themselves sexually as, mm -hmm. as uh, queer people either. And then the other thing I noticed a lot with my male clients was a sense of demasculinization mm. almost like i i don't feel like i'm really a man because i couldn't i couldn't make conversion therapy work and how do i restore my identity if i ever had one as a male uh and then of course there are just the bizarre uh, i mean i'm so glad i wish our religious institutions might follow the lead of the Church of England that came out with an advisory statement uh, at some point, I think I read, you know, to say, do not attempt exorcisms, right. for example. Okay. It's like, okay, we're going to, to pray to Jesus, but if that doesn't work, obviously, you know, Satan has inhabited you, and now we need to go through these absolutely, but I mean, I've had people go through uh, uh, lacerations on their skin, being belched on, being, uh, 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 you know, live chickens. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the exo... I, I don't need to go... Oh, chili in the eyes, I heard of. That's why. Yes. Yeah, I mean, awful, yes. absolute torture. Yeah. Complete yeah, torture. So uh, we do need some guidance for folks because there are a lot of well-intentioned therapists out there mm. who are seeing survivors of conversion therapy who have no idea what to do with them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Adam Joe, I saw came into the chat uh, about 20 minutes ago. I don't know if he was here at the beginning, but I saw he popped up uh, on my board. And I wonder, Adam, oh, if Adam's this, here. Yeah, Adam's here. I wonder if you wanted to say anything, Adam, or feed into this conversation. And um, whilst you're thinking about that, I see Jeremy's put a question in. Um, has the evidence-based practice movement taken a position on conversion therapy in the USA? Well, now that's an interesting question. The evidence-based practice movement, um, uh, you know, ever since 2005, when APA adopted uh, 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 a resolution in support of evidence-based practice, I haven't heard a thing about this particular issue. Uh, I, my guess, without knowing, uh, is that people in that movement would say, well, conversion therapy is de facto included because we've already established there's no evidence base for mm -hmm. it. But mm -hmm. as far as I know, the, the people working in that area uh, haven't put out any kind of a public statement. But that's an interesting question. Right. Uh, I I, I, what I saw in your book was very much, it's all about the evidence. That's what you're interested right. in, in putting yeah. into the book. We're not interested in, in half-baked ideas. It's, it's very much evidence-led. Um, Adam is going to have a ha, 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 join our conversation. So um, 
LJ's unmuted him. Thanks, Dominic. Sorry, I, I couldn't unmute. Um, yeah, it's really interesting conversation. Thanks for inviting me in. Um, I don't know if it was already mentioned earlier, but I did the um, I led the government commissioned research on mm -hmm. on conversion therapy. Adam, um, I mentioned you at the beginning because that report is just spectacular. So thank you for that. Thanks, Doug. Um, yeah. So um, so in our report, we obviously we looked at all of the international literature for both sexual orientation change efforts and gender identity change efforts. We also interviewed people who'd undergone conversion therapy in the UK, um, LGBT um, and, and A as well. Um, Good. And we interviewed fewer trans people, but I think one of the, the, the key things was that the, the similarities in the, the experiences that they had with the lesbian, gay and bisexual people. Mm -hmm. And in fact, often they said that the people who were doing it made no distinction about sure. exactly being gay and uh, bisexual and trans people. They saw them all as you know the same. In mm -hmm. fact, one of our participants said that she was given a book on homosexuality, and um, when they said, "Well, I'm trans," they said, "Well, it's all the same. This this book this book will apply to you." Um, so this idea that you can tackle one one thing without tackling the other i just i find a bit strange it's crazy isn't it it's crazy and so i i just don't know how they can expect us as therapists to proceed to explore and exclude certain you know we're only going to work with some people and not with others um to, to try to leave out trans trans people exploring their gender it's it's it that it's just if you've got a, a sissy boy as I said in my blog on Friday, who's coming in for help with his bullying, is am I not to talk to him because he's manifesting gender non-conforming behaviour or am I allowed to work with him because he might be a sissy boy? Uh, mm -hmm. It just doesn't make sense, really. Um, and I think they're going to have to really tighten, be, be very clear about that. The other thing that the government were talking about was people they were going to allow people who consented to a conversion therapy to undergo conversion therapy that was in their original plans i don't know whether that will feature but i don't know whether you've got any thoughts about that doug if you consent it's okay you can have it oh i got a few thoughts about that <laughs> i do not believe that in this realm there is such a thing as consent i don't think that anybody attempts conversion therapy without having the metaphorical equivalent of a gun to your head, whether that is a, a loss of your family, of mm -hmm. standing in your community, mm -hmm. of membership in your community of faith, or if it is simply due to the internalization of years of self-abnegation around sexual orientation or gender identity, there is no such thing as free will, free choice. I mean, let's, if there were, wouldn't we see heterosexuals wanting to change their sexual orientation and become gay? It's fabulous, right? It uh -huh. is, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and so, and that is why uh, I think even though the disparity, uh, Adam, at the beginning, I was mentioning this disparity in, in research findings between sexual orientation, conversion therapy, and that for gender identity. But nonetheless, the research that is there on gender identity uh, conversion therapy is very, very compelling on, on the kinds of harms. And I hope that that report is front and center in the discussion, whatever discussion, the MPs and the prime minister are having at this point around maybe they should do yet another U-turn and bring the T back in mm. because it, it's not supportable otherwise. Thank you. That's a very good comment. I mean, I was just going to come to us uh, to see whether you had a closing comment for our MPs and for Boris Johnson oh. <laughs> on, on this. I mean, oh. that was a great closing comment in a way, but I don't, you may have some further advice about why it's so important well, to include gender as part of this. You know, the last time you had a national election, Mm -hmm. I actually was in London and was invited by a dear friend to be the guest 
at the home of a former uh, Labour MP mm -hmm. uh, in London, and we all were watching the election returns on the television. And I, I have to say, for me, it was a little PS PTSD from 2016 in our national election, mm -hmm. just thinking, oh my God, Disaster. you're kidding. The Tories mm -hmm. are taking over everything. I say that because I guess what I would say to if I could address Parliament today, I would say whatever your affiliation is, and I know you want to keep being elected in your jurisdictions or whatever, but please consider human lives are at stake here. Do not make this a political issue. Please read the research. Please see this for the public health issue and the public health danger that it is. And it is your duty as MPs in the UK government to provide guidance to your people in that regard. No, you shouldn't be making public health policy, but you should be endorsing that which is backed by research. That's my plea to you. And thank you with all respect for taking that from uh, a person from outside your country. Thank you, Doug. That's really helpful. And, and thank you everybody else for participating in today's uh, conversation. And to, I, I'm particularly grateful to my assistants from LJ and Joe who have been busy in the chat and making sure everyone's well informed. So please do get the word out there. We will be putting this recording onto YouTube uh, either later this evening or by tomorrow morning. Please share it with your MPs share it with your colleagues. Let's see what we can do about this. Thank you all so much for coming. Bye-bye.